About a year ago, I had the Hyundai engine up on a stand. Has it been that long, really? Yes. It was October 14th, a year and three weeks. During my build, I pulled a bunch of parts off of my turbo pile and my Hyundai's old blown up engine that I wasn't going to use anymore. I figured they probably still had some life left in them, and I already went with a bigger 20G anyway, so an old 14B is of no consequence to me. I called my friend Chad to see if he might have an idea of what to do with it. Sure enough, he had something in need of an entire DSM hot side from the manifold on back. Instead of letting my shelves sag under their weight, why not pass these perfectly good parts on to what's now the fourth car project for yet another round? You might ask what kind of DSM Chad has. Well, he doesn't. This is Foofy. Originally concepted as Project Loose Tooth, but this is Foofy. Foofy is a $300 1992 Honda Accord DX base model, manual everything. Four-door sedan with a manual transmission. 250,000 mile old stock F22A single overhead cam, 2.2 liter, 125 horsepower engine. At least that's what it was before this happened to it. This project started out with all the Hyundai's old go-fast parts. A used fuel pump, a pile of old stock intake parts, and whatever was laying around in mine or Chad's garages. Thanks to Jamie and the used parts market, we're like the 6th or 7th owners of these parts. Of course, Foofy needed some injectors to go with this turbo setup, and since 1992 Accords have low impedance injectors, DSM 450cc injectors were nearly a drop-in fit. No resistor box needed. I said nearly because the injector seals had to be sanded down smaller with a flap wheel in order to fit back inside the Honda intake manifold seal bosses with the DSM injector crammed into them. The exhaust manifold was massaged carefully so that it bolted directly onto a Honda block, and you can get away with using a DSM manifold on this head because of how similar the DSM exhaust manifold flanges are to the F22 and F23. We ended up going with a 1G manifold because they were in plentiful supply in both of our garages. The first manifold was practice. We knew it was cracked and wanted to make all the mistakes that could be made with something that wouldn't make anyone feel guilty for turning into scrap. Then we used it as a model, which we crafted version 2. Version 2 didn't have any cracks in it. It was tied up in my video shoot at the time, so he started his mock-up without me. But here it is. We're going to take this thing off so you can get a look at the flanges and how a Honda gasket lines up on both of them. It's pretty cut and dry even though nothing ever got wet. All you have to do is drill three holes bigger and wallow two holes out to the side a bit and the runners all line up. You can use the Honda exhaust manifold gasket as a guide to make your marks and then grind away with a die grinder. Or you can use a drill press. Or if you like punishment, you could use a round file. But the similarities are profound. The runner sizes are really close. The Honda runners are just a tad smaller on the F22 head, and that's not a problem at all. In fact, it's favorable. Because the turbocharger hangs off the manifold and shares space with the front engine roll stop mount, one of those parts has to go. And you know it's not going to be the turbo, or else this is going to be a really short video. We figured, it's just an engine mount. It has three others. Nobody's going to miss that, right? What do you want for free? A re-engineered front roll stopper mount? Ain't nobody got a time for that. It's a tight fit, but it fits. Because this engine is a 2.2 liter, this thing will spool the living daylights out of a 14B. Instant boost. And despite popular opinion, these single overhead cam head ports flow better than all of the dual overhead cam stuff from Honda's smaller displacement engines. Slightly freakish, I know, but it's a true story. It flows around 300 CFM per runner, which is more than all but the very most expensively CNC ported 1G and 2G 4G 6.3 cylinder heads out there as well. And it offers more lift. I'm not kidding. And to think, this is the engine that the vast majority of Honda performance enthusiasts remove and throw away in order to fit something bigger and badder in it. It's a throwaway. Sure, it shares a platform with a Prelude. But it's usually the Prelude owners who are the ones throwing these things away for what they consider to be better platforms. What if your idea of best means cheaper and faster? Like, practically free. The turbine outlet has a stock 1G Eclipse flange bolted to it, with stock rubber hoses that used to be on the Hyundai. We're using a stock side mount 1G DSM intercooler in this location, but mostly because that's the direction the intercooler pipes are pointing. We would have put it in a better place, but the way the frame fits in the front of this car, there wasn't any room to plumb it in as a side mount. So we cut a speed hole in the fender well and pretty much just used the intercooler as a shunt to connect it to the upper intercooler pipe. Yes, that's a radiator hose for a throttle body elbow. Shut up! It worked. We filled the gap between that hose and the intercooler with a 1G Eclipse blow-off valve flange and pipe. We didn't spend a whole lot of time on that. Some of the things you need in order to make this kind of swap happen depend on your facilities, tools, time, and skills. The more you have of those things, the less and less this kind of upgrade costs. 
For instance, Chad made his own downpipe from a 2.5 inch DIY J-Bend and a DIY O2 bung and welded it to a DSM O2 housing flange. He did that with a TIG welder in his garage. Not everybody has that capability, but it was needed in order to bring all these parts together. The downpipe mated to the stock B-pipe and catalytic converter and used the stock muffler as an exit. This setup made for one exceptionally stock appearing turbo accord. Not only is it stealthy, it's even quieter than the stock accord because the turbine is plugging up both the intake and the exhaust. <laughs> Part throttle driving wasn't the least bit compromised because of the higher compression ratio and a factory Honda camshaft profile, but in order to deliver the proper amount of fuel, that required some complicated testing and tuning. The most expensive part added to this build was a Honda ECU upgrade. Second, the wideband oxygen sensor installation. The least possible amount of time and money was spent on making this thing happen, and it earned the name Foofy because the only sound it made when you let out of the throttle was foof. Foofy hasn't been all fun in games though. The Hyundai's old 14B bit the dust early on in the project due to oil starvation, and it was replaced with a free used Chinese Evo 3 16G. 17,000 miles later, the old worn out F-Series finally found its limit. That was at 28 PSI with about 750 RPMs left of fifth gear. It ran out of ring gap and the ring grooves gave out because the rings began to seize inside the bore. At least that one did anyway. Honda engines are typically fuel efficient, lightweight, cool running, normally aspirated engines. And Honda's known for having high quality castings and precision machine work with tight tolerances. That doesn't work well with turbocharged engines because they burn more air and fuel making more heat and experience much higher cylinder pressures. More heat means increased thermal expansion. This is the main limiting factor to a boosted Honda build that prevents people from making better use of their wastegates and their boost gauges. So the more worn out your F-Series is, the better it will take to your turbo experiment. Chad managed to prove this twice including a JDM F23 engine with only 56,000 miles and he bolted the old F22A1 head to it. That's when it became the F-bomb. That engine made it about a thousand miles because the Chinese 20G didn't have a dowel pin on the compressor housing and that wastegate actuator is bolted to it. While at full throttle, the compressor housing reclocked itself and held the wastegate shut. It did that twice into the throttle at an unknown pressure somewhere over 30 PSI and it went pop. It happened two pulls after this run with a witness, but no video, sorry. Time for F-bomb 3. Chad found a complete F-22A1 with a hundred something thousand miles on it for a hundred bucks. And since it's the exact same F-22A1 engine as Foofy 1 inside and out, we're just moving over the oil pan, valve cover, hot side, cold side, and the oil feed line from Foofy 2. All of the necessary modifications were done to those parts on the original engine and the chassis making this a cakewalk for us. But now you get to see them all. The battery was trunk mounted in order to make room for the intake pipes and a lug was installed on the fender to complete all of the power connections up front. During the wideband sensor installation, Chad took the word gauge cup literally. The gauge is mounted inside an actual cup in the center console. Here's the mileage when F-bomb 3 was being installed. Over a quarter million miles. It probably could have gone a million more if we didn't boost it, but what fun is that? And who wants to be stuck inside a $300 car for a million miles? So let's go over what's necessary to build a cheap turbo Honda project. You need a 92 Accord and then the oil pan won't work in its stock form. So you'll need an oil return hole on the oil pan so that the turbo has somewhere to put the hot oil once it's done with it. Previously a bung was welded onto the oil pan. Most people would pay about 20 bucks for a bung hole and then have to weld it on. But Chad just cut off a hydraulic fitting off of a piece of broken equipment and used that instead. So the cost can be anywhere between zero dollars and pay somebody else whatever. Next thing we've got to do is put it all in time. Chad tore this one down and he lined up all the marks before removing the belt so that they'd be in the right position. He almost took the head off so he turned the crank 90 degrees but then he decided against it. So that's why he's moving it back. The timing marks were highlighted to make them easier to see here. An F-22 has balance shafts that you have to align a specific way or else they'll rattle your teeth out. The cam is easy to set and it's conveniently stamped with the word up on the side that must face up. The rear or right balance shaft must be timed carefully. The mark on the outside can be deceiving because there's gear reduction going on inside of that front case to spin the balance shaft faster. 
So if you don't know that its orientation is correct, remove this plug and thread an M6 by 100 millimeter bolt through that hole into the block to align the rear shaft. Ours was aligned in a position before the old timing belt and balance belts were removed and it hasn't been disturbed. So it's on with the timing belts for us. We have these components to install. It's actually the timing belt off of the thousand mile old F-bomb 2 build and the bearings and the pulleys are still good so they're being reused. Start with the timing tensioner over the big stud and hook the spring in place. Install its pivot bolt. Next, hang the balancer belt tensioner on the big stud and loosely secure it with a nut. Attach the balancer tensioner arm and spring and then install the pivot bolt. Make sure they both move freely and have spring tension throughout their whole range of movement. Now grab your timing belt. Start on the bottom crank sprocket and stay to the left side of the tensioner. Go over the top of the cam sprocket while paying close attention to your timing marks. Once aligned, slip the right side of the belt over the water pump gear. Now or any time before now is the time to have the woodruff key in place on your crankshaft. If your timing marks line up flush with the top of the valve cover flange and you're aware that your rear timing cover is not even with the valve cover flange, then your valves are in time and you can move on to the balancer belt. Let's go ahead and take care of that woodruff key now, shall we? Now install the balancer pulley. Make life easy on yourself and install a belt with the balancer pulley. Keep all of your marks lined up. Torque your crank bolt to whatever the manual says to or however tight your impact wrench goes, either one. And now it's time to set the tension. The F22 belt tension is set by turning the crankshaft three teeth counterclockwise and then you torque the tensioner nut to lock both pulleys down. Honda engines spin counterclockwise and turning the crank that way tightens the long side of the belt against the specific spring tension achieved at the third tooth. Go ahead and crank the engine over a bunch of times with a crank bolt until all the marks line up again and then that helps you check your work. Next comes the timing mount. The timing belt cover. the crank pulley, the upper timing cover, and then we add a little ATF to each combustion chamber to help lubricate and seal the rings for when we start it up. Now it's valve cover gasket time. RTV sealant was used in the joints of the valve cover flange. We're going to use a new valve cover gasket set. These include four new spark plug seals and four new rubber washer seals for the valve cover nuts that snug everything down. Make sure you torque these finger tight, smoothly and evenly, and until they're all the way squished down. Now that we've got the crankcase sealed up, the front engine mount flange needs to be cut off so that the turbo can fit. It's important to take the basic precautions and stuff rags and all the openings where you don't want metal dust. Chad's had plenty of practice at this, so I'll just stay back here out of his way. Now I know you're probably cringing at the thought of cutting off an engine mount, and you're completely justified in doing so. This isn't a good idea at all, and I'm not recommending this as a performance modification in any way, shape, or form. This isn't weight reduction. The goal here is cheap performance, not extreme safety. The kind of thing that would go wrong here won't result in a crash or an explosion. It results in the kind of thing that makes you go, hey, I can't keep driving a car that's making noises like this. But so far, Foofy's managed to blow up two engines and not have that problem even once. The engine is not going to fall out of the car. The timing and transmission mounts are far too stout to ever permit that. Plus, there's still another beefy roll stop mount left on the back of the engine to help keep things centered. Chad intends to engineer something eventually, but for now it hasn't presented a problem. This is an F23 timing cover off of a right-hand drive car. It didn't line up quite straight, so we filled the gap with silicone to keep dirt out. Now it just needs a hot side, a cold side, and a transmission. Since these parts are just being moved from one engine to the other, there's no need in complicating things by taking it any further apart. In fact, we're not even using new gaskets because the old ones are a thousand miles old. If you're using the Honda gasket like we are, you may need to grind the rivets out of the gasket layers to prevent crushing them between the flanges because the outside of the DSM manifold flange isn't exactly the same shape as the Honda. It's close. It's real close. 
but just watch out for that. We need a few studs off the other engine as well. Same thing goes for the alternator mounting brackets and the power steering brackets. Just move them over. One thing you need to be aware of if you're using a stock DSM manifold on your F-Series build is that you'll need to put the manifold on prior to installing the power steering bracket and don't bolt it down. You need to install the power steering bracket and bolts first because the casting of the 1G manifold gets in the way of installing the bolt. These parts compete for space in two different places, so if you did it the other way around, the exhaust manifold just isn't soft and squishy enough to squeeze in there or to let you install that bolt without taking all these parts back off again. Bolt everything down as tight as you can get it without stripping out the studs. Make sure that all the fasteners are evenly torqued. You don't want any exhaust leaks, and if you do this right, you won't have any. This particular stud on this corner, you're just not going to be able to do anything about other than use a big washer to ensure that there's enough contact area to stay put. That's just how it goes. Not enough meat on that side of a 1G manifold. Whatever. Alternator bracket. Dipstick tube. Now it's time for the cold side. Same exact cold side as Foofy 1 and 2. The fuel rail and injectors are bolted to the intake manifold so there's no point in taking them loose. We had the same problem with the intake studs walking away on the new engine as well. And it's nice to have so many donor engines laying around to pull them from. If the same engine wasn't nearby, trust me, we'd have found some other free way of doing this from something else laying around the shop. But having spared donor engines saved us the trouble. Before we go blocking up the back side of the engine with the intake manifold, there's one more detail that needs to be sorted out for a turbo build on a Honda. And that's the provision for a turbo oil feed tap location factory oil pressure sending unit is on the back of the block. So too must be the main oil gallery, or else the sensor wouldn't be there. But we need an oil feed line as well as that sending unit. To remedy this, an NPTT block was rummaged from a random bucket of parts, and a 4AN fitting was threaded into the port on the other side. This allows you to keep your oil pressure gauge, which you need. I didn't have a DSM oil feed line to give them, this stainless steel braided oil feed line is really a leftover nitrous feed line laying around on a shelf from an old Firebird project. It even had a metric banjo fitting for the turbo side. It's ridiculously long, but it's free. Freaking hilarious. So that's everything on the block that you have to change. It's just stupid how the DSM stuff lines up on this thing and it fits so well. But that's what's so funny about this car. It was actually a cheaper build than the Hyundai was prior to my being gifted with it. Because Foofy's complete running chassis cost half as much. That, and it received free injectors and turbo parts from the free Hyundai that Jamie built in a junkyard budget and gave to me. What's even funnier about that is the parts in Jamie's Hyundai came from an Eagle Talon and a Plymouth Laser that I parted out back in 2005. Jamie used them in a Mitsubishi Mirage hatchback prior to installing them on my Hyundai, and now some of them are on this Honda Accord. This is what happens when you put all of these things in the hands of a Chevy guy. This is cross-pollination of automotive manufacturers at its absolute worst. And it works. It works well. Here we are on round three. Another bone stock F22A with a DSM hot side and DSM injectors. That's all it is. It takes more investment than just bolting free parts together in order to deliver the right amount of fuel to this thing. This is one area where money needed to be spent and it can't be avoided. Chad went with a Honda to ECU for engine management because of the simplicity of installation and the widespread use and support of this product in the Honda community. The car, the ECU, the wideband controller, the fuel system, the gauge, and all of the gaskets and service parts helped put Fufi 1 together with a combined all-in cost of just under $1,300. You know Chad already, but that's Chris. Chris has been an enormous help all along. He's a curious Prelude owner and a Honda tuner who was all too willing to volunteer to help. I think Foofy surprised all of us. The F22 is much easier to find stuff for, but it's still fairly limited in aftermarket support. You really have to know its strong points and limitations in order to make the best of it. Tight Honda ring gaps and tight piston to cylinder wall clearances means that you need to do whatever's necessary to keep your combustion chamber temperatures down, or else thermal expansion will end up getting the best of you. If you don't do machine work to make room for thermal expansion, just be smart about your boost levels, because as pressure increases, so does heat, thermal expansion, and blow-by. Chad is determined to keep it under 15 pounds this time around, and just enjoy it the way it is for now. 
It's plenty of fun at 10 PSI on the street because it more than doubles its factory horsepower and torque output with this particular turbo, and it still provides a good bit of safety for the tune. It also has really tall gear ratios that make the boost a whole lot more fun. Finally, something other than an Elantra video, right? I could probably straighten the lines. It's kinda ugly. Look at the car. <laughs> I'm sure you're wondering how Foofy rolls. Let's go for a ride, shall we?